Subhanallah, this dunya, the world, is something that is filled with distractions. When we look at life, people get distracted into many things. There is a beautiful statement of Malik ibn Dinar. He said, Kharaja mafalis al dunya, aw fi rawaya ahl al dunya minha. فَلَمْ يَذُوقُوا أَتِيبْ أَوْ أَفْضَلْ شَيْ فِيهَا فَقِيلَ مَا هِيَا فَقَالَ مَعْرَفَةُ اللَّهِ He said the broke people or the people of the dunya and who is he referring to as the statement has been explained by the ulema he is referring to those kings and rich and powerful people that the awam, the regular people see to be the richest and most powerful of people. And he calls them the bankrupt people. He said they kharaja, they left from this dunya, the ahlul dunya, the people who love this dunya, they left this dunya and they did not taste the best thing, the most wonderful, the greatest of joys of this dunya. Somebody asked him, what is that? He said, Ma'rifatullah, knowing Allah. You know, when we look at life, if somebody is an expert in making money, and he knows how to make money any which way, people think that he's made it. If somebody can seize power in a government and have authority, people think he's made it. If somebody can get fame and have followings and people, fans, women, men, whatever, people think they made it. But in reality, if you don't know Allah and you don't know what is the purpose of your life and you don't know where you came from and you don't know where you're going, then in the end you die and everything gets left behind. There's a famous story, it's not a hadith, it's a story. That there was a man who used to take people on the river Nile. And he had a boat and he would take people across. And one day there was a person that was sitting with him that was highly educated. And the person sitting with him paid him to take him across. And the, and the man was just a, a, a man who rode a boat, he, he wasn't educated, he was just a regular guy. So the highly educated man told him, do you know philosophy? He told him, no, I don't know. I'm just a simple guy. I make my salah, I pray, I ride the boat, that's it. He says, you haven't lived. You've just, you wasted your life. You didn't study philosophy. Uh, the man was the captain of the boat. was like, you know, whatever. You're going to pay me. Just <laughs> don't care. So the man told him, you know mathematics? He told him, no. He told him, you don't know algebra, trig. You don't know all these things. He told him, no. And you wasted your life. You know Beethoven, you know music, you know culture. He, he, he mentioned all these things to make the, the, the sa'iq or the, the, the one who takes the boat feel low. But the man just kept quiet. And if you've ever been to the Nile, it's actually a very fast moving river. You know? And when it goes up and down and things, it's very dangerous. So waves came, storm came, the boat started to tip over. So the one who would be the captain of the boat, the, the man who takes it, he told a very educated man, he goes, do you know how to swim? He told him, no. He goes, you wasted your life, good luck. <laughs> Jumped off the boat, swam across. Huh? So in the end, if we don't know Allah, we don't know the sifat of Allah, we don't know what Allah wants from us, we don't know what Allah created us for, then in the end, all that money, all that wealth, all that power, what are you going to do with it? It's very simple. You know, myself, may Allah protect us all, I was raised in a very rough childhood. And when I came towards the religion, a lot of people used to ask me like, how did you change, you know, from uh, being very far from the religion? And how did... So, you know, it's very simple. <laughs> 
When I actually thought about it, it was very simple. And what are you going to do? You know, I had a very close friend at the time. And he was two years older than me. He was from the same gang as I used to be with. And he got shot. It's a long story. You can watch the YouTube videos. I, I won't go into a detail here. But I remember his funeral. He was Catholic. And I remember it like it's yesterday. And I remember his body being put into the ground. And it was very simple. At the time I was 18, about 17, 18, and he was about 20. And at the time, all we had thought about was money, fame, women, popularity, cars, all these kinds of things. But when I saw him being buried, none of that went with him. Nobody buried him in his car. No girl stepped into the grave with him. No bank balance, no checkbook, no cash buried with him. In a few years, even the gang people forgot his name. Today, if you go to the same gang neighborhood, nobody knows who he is. The graffiti gets painted over. All that power, what good is it? So it's very simple. You have to prepare for what the purpose of your life is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, بَعْدَ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ مَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ وَقَالَ سُبْحَانَ وَتَعَلَى خَلَقْتُ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا In these ayat, everything is made simple, clear. That we did not create the jinn or ins, the jinn or mankind, except to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can you worship Allah without knowing Allah? And in awwalan ma'rafatullah, you have to know who you're worshiping. So the purpose of your creation is to first and foremost get to know who is Allah. Who created you? Why did He create you? And then is Islam to submit. That's Islam, that's a Muslim. To submit your will to your creator. And this is why in Surah Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about him, the one who created death and life, to see which one of you puts forth the best of deeds. Subhanallah, if we contemplate tadabbur on the Quran, you get beautiful fawaid from it. Do we live first or do we die first? Huh? Live first, right? You guys aren't asleep yet, right? Uh, what do we live first or die first? Only one person answered, huh? Are you guys alive? <laughs> and death is coming, right? So you live first. But in this, in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةِ Death and life. What's mentioned first? Death. Don't let David Wood watch this, you know, and he's going to think he found a contradiction. <laughs> no, as the ulema of tafsir, salam mentioned, as Sheikh Abdul Salam and others, they said, why? Because the word mawt here references the worldly life. Mawt here is a reference to the worldly life. In hayat, Life is a reference to the life of the hereafter. Why? Because this life was meant for death. Hayatul dunya, the worldly life is meant for death. Nobody's going to live this life forever. Many tried. Fir'aun wanted to live forever. All the pharaohs, they wanted to be mummified and all this to be lived to live forever. Many kings, they tried to find the fountain of youth. They want to live forever. Michael Jackson wanted to live forever. They're all dead. Kullu nafsin dha'aikutul maut. Every soul shall taste death. It's a promise from Allah. So this life is temporary. And that life of the hereafter, it's forever. 
Al-hayatul akhirah. This is why it's called hayat, because there's no death in it. You will live forever and ever. Look, this life is, is a test. It's a period. You're in your examination hall. And the sad thing is, many people don't even realize that. Many people are going through this examination time, not realizing that they're on a timer. And imagine if you're at a university and you're about to take your final exams and they set a timer and they say, you have one hour to finish. And you, you're, you're here, now the computer's in front of you and you're, you got the randomly generated questions coming up and you're sitting there shopping for shoes. You're sitting there on your phone, checking out shoes. Somebody can say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm trying to find deals in shoes, man. I like shoes. Like, okay, hey, do that later. It's not the time for it right now. Right now you got to focus on your exam. Like, nah, man. I'm trying to buy some shoes. Kicks. You would think that man is crazy. But look at us in this dunya. We miss salah. We don't fast when we should. And fard fasting I'm talking about. People are cheap with their zakat. Forget about sadaqah. People drink what Allah has made haram. They eat what Allah has made haram. They lie when Allah has made haram. They don't think that this is the examination time. They don't think that this time will be up. And then what? When you face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, what will be your excuse? What made you busy from salah? What made you busy from attending the masjid? What was more important than calling others towards the truth? My respected brothers and sisters in Islam, this is a responsibility we have ignored as an ummah. And we don't realize that Allah will take us to task for it. You know, in Arabic, there are two types of languages, lisan. There is lisan maqal, that which is said. And then there is lisan al-hal, that which your condition shows. Do you understand the difference or no? Did I lose you guys yet? Are you good? I'm not worried about the camera, I'm worried about you guys. man. Huh? I'm on the camera all the time. <laughs> huh? What does it mean? If a shaykhana comes to me and he tells me, how you doing? Or, or like here he goes, you all right? <laughs> and I tell him, <laughs> I'm great. <laughs> I'm saying I'm great, but looking at me, he will tell me, no, something's wrong. Your lisan maqal is saying you're doing great, but your lisan al-hal is saying something else. This is the difference. <laughs> if you see somebody jumping, rejoicing and happy, and you tell him, oh, mashallah, what happened? Nothing. Everything's horrible. Don't give me a'in. You know? <laughs> See, again, it doesn't fit. So, bilisan maqal, we say that the Prophet ﷺ is the last Nabi. And that is our aqidah. He's the last Prophet. Right? Okay. If he's the last Prophet, which he is, no doubt, who will take that responsibility of anbiya? And who will convey this message of Islam? Who will show mankind what the purpose of their creation is? Who will be that, that messenger of the messenger? To take that risala, that message. To tell people, look, you're not here on accident. You didn't evolve from a monkey or a fish or a, I don't know, a piece of DNA from a banana or whatever else people think. You were created by Allah. You come from Adam والسلام, and you were created with purpose and you have a greater life coming. Who will take that responsibility? We say us, but if we are not out there calling people, people who don't know, if we're not out there calling them in action, then our lisan of hal does not fit with our lisan maqal. We're saying it, but we're not doing it. See, this life is very valuable. 
It's very precious. Not because, oh, you just got to live it up. Because even if you live it up to the most you can. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us in the hadith that if you take somebody who lived the most luxurious life, fulfilled all their desires, the best what you can imagine, and you give them one dip, you just dip them in the nar, in the hellfire, and you ask them, did you see a single comfort? They will say, wallahi, I didn't have a single comfort. All of that will be forgotten. And the one who lived the hardest life, some people tell us the, the problem of evil or suffering, and they think as if like something we can't answer, it's easy. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us, even if somebody had the harshest life, the most troubles, the, imagine not just the refugees and war and rape, or no, the worst, imagine all of mankind, the hardest life anybody's ever lived. And you give them one dip in al-Jannah, in the paradise. You tell them, have you ever even seen a single hardship? They'll say, wallahi, I've never seen a hardship. That's how beautiful Jannah. So when you know this, you have to convey that message. You have to tell people that you can't be tricked by pastors and preachers and pundits and rabbis and all these fake peers and this and that. You can't be taken astray by that. You have to go back to the Quran. You have to go back to the Sunnah. You have to go back to the Aqeedah, the correct belief. You have to know who Allah is. You have to strive and struggle to learn. And then you have to strive and struggle to do the best you can to gain the mercy of Allah. But if people don't know, and you know, then don't you think Allah will take you to task? You lived there, you lived next to people, you worked next to them. I mean, I don't know what happened to us. Today, you talk about da'wah, you talk about this, somebody goes, yes, I spent all my time in da'wah, mashallah. What do you do? I go to the masjid next door, then I go visit the imam, then I have chai with him, mashallah. Then I have ta'aleem, which everybody sleeps through. No, da'wah is like the anbiya. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to go out amongst the people, Muslim al-Hajj, to the kuffar. And he would remind them, look, there is an akhirah. There is a hereafter. You have a Lord, Allah, who created you. Where did you come from? He would refute their misconceptions about their idols and their tawassul through their uh, gods or whatever they wanted to make as means to get to Allah. He would tell them, no. You worship Allah, not through Lot and Uzzah and things. No, you worship Allah directly. And he would correct the evils and he would address the evils of society. He wouldn't just say, don't talk about ikhtilafi muscles. No, he would address what he saw as evil. Lut salam, he didn't just go and talk about Tawheed. Yes, he talked about Tawheed, but he also addressed the evils that were in front of him. He didn't say just talk about giving sadaqah because then that won't upset the people. No, if you see an evil, you make rot of it. So this is the way of the anbiya. And this is our responsibility today. When we see a society where the ills of society, the breakdown of the family structure, the breakdown of a moral code, the breakdown of societal moral values, have corrupted society so much that we hardly see a household anywhere 